Hello, welcome to our NFT event. My name is Ina and I am a second year student at Cognitive Science and Artificial Intelligence Department here in Tilburg University. And I'm about to guide you through this event. Uh, this is an event hosted by Studium Generale and uh, in collaboration with Animo and Enigma, which are both uh, student associations. Enigma is my student association, which is for my course, so Cognitive Science and Artificial Intelligence and Animo is for online cultures and culture studies. And yeah, I'm going to I'm going to first guide you through the how the event is going to look like. We have two speakers followed by a Q&A for those two speakers and then a little break, other two speakers and followed by another Q&A and then in the end an interactive discussion. Okay. Oh, wait. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> well, that's good to break the ice. Let's talk about NFTs. What comes to mind when you think of non-fungible tokens? Can you understand only the none? Because that's what first happened with me. So fungible. Fungible, non-fungible basically means that you can track its ownership. It own, somebody owns it, you can own it publicly. And token, token is used because it covers a lot of things. NFTs can be from tweets to pictures to videos, game clips, um, digital perfume, dog sticks, even real estate. There's a lot of things being sold as NFTs and a lot of people have it. Even uh, Snoop Dogg and Eminem made a video for the VMAs with their uh, board Ape Yacht Club, Yacht Club NFTs. You might have seen it. Madonna has one. She has this one. And it makes you think, why did Madonna choose this one? Well, she didn't. She wanted this one. But this one was too expensive for Madonna. This monkey was too expensive for Madonna. Yeah. Ooh, ooh. Oh, wait. <laughs> we need to come back. Ooh, you get to see my slides, sorry. This one was too expensive for Madonna. So she settled for that one. She settled by paying $500,000 US dollars. That's called settling for a different type of monkey. So we don't know why this monkey is worth more than this one or why this doodle is worth 25 times more than this monkey. And that's on sale. So. NFTs are not something you can comprehend very, very easily. It's something that has a lot of irregularities and a lot of weird trends, but it's something that's definitely interesting. Is this a revolution in art or are we all material girls living in a material world? Let's find out. <laughs> Our first speaker today is uh, Dominic Gut. He's a researcher and a teacher at Erasmus University. He teaches economics of digital markets, research message, and web scraping. I invite you all to welcome Dominic Gut. Thank you so much, Ina, for the um, kind of introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dominic. I'm from Erasmus. Uh, super excited to be here today. Uh, talking to you about uh, the past, present, and future of NFTs. And um, nowadays, I'm always starting out by saying, um, I think this is the, la the, the largest in-person crowd I've talked to uh, since 2019. So uh, I, I'm, I'm even more excited about that. Um, still a bit rusty, but uh, going to shake it off quick, I think. So Ina, thanks for setting the stage. Uh, actually, I was almost um, not supposed to be here because uh, actually who got invited is my, my PhD and co-author Yanis. You see him here on the left side. And, uh, but he's sick today, so I'm subbing for him. Uh, and let me, let me start out by telling our past, present, and future about NFTs. You know, um, this guy is super talented. We, we, we're working on NFTs together, and when we started out in the past, he was like, Dominic, we should buy NFTs. It's going to make us rich. 
Uh, now our president is still, we're working together and he's still, you Dominic, we, we should buy NFTs or we should have bought NFTs. And I'm sure, you know, if you fast forward 20 years from now, what he's going to say is, Dominic, we should have bought NFTs. <laughs> you know, uh, looking back at, uh, or having the slides in mind that I'm going to show you, I'm not sure if that's really true. Future's going to tell. Um, but that's just kind of um, past, present, future in a nutshell, personally. But of course, in this, in this presentation, I want to give you a bit more details, give you a bit more run through, okay, what happened, what, what's happening now, what's happening in the future. Yeah. And we're all learning kind of together. I was doing a lot of prep for this presentation, uh, digging up the history, and I thought, okay, there's no better place than a, than a real museum. And so it happened that I, I went to Seattle uh, a couple of weeks ago, and Seattle is actually home to the world's first NFT museum that you can actually go physically, not virtually. And there's a lot uh, I learned there, and some of that uh, is in the slides today. So, for example, what I didn't know, maybe you, maybe you know much more about NFTs than me, so that's also why I'm excited to be here. So, one thing I didn't know is that the first NFT was actually, um, or kind of NFT, was called Colored Coins. It was minted on the, on the Bitcoin chain, and it was actually um, just changing the metadata of Bitcoin. I'm sure you all know, changing the metadata of Bitcoin such that they take colors. Now, they're not particularly non-fungible because, you know, Bitcoins are fungible, and, but that happened in 2012. Now, what happened in 2014 was that the first, or what mo uh, most people believe is the first NFT was minted. It was called Quantum, was minted by Kevin McCaw, and it just recently sold for 1.4 million US dollars. It, it's a GIF. It doesn't look too fancy, but that was kind of uh, the, birth, the birth hour that I consider of NFTs. It's called Quantum. That happened in 2014. What happened in 2015 was kind of a quantum leap. All the famous NFT connections that we know today, most of them are minted on the Ethereum chain. And uh, that, was, that was established in 2015. And uh, soon after the birth of Ethereum, something very essential for the internet, namely gaming, came on the stage for, for Ethereum. The first actual game on Ethereum was called Etheria, and it was this artsy, nerdy, uh, kind of crafty, we don't really know what we're doing, but we're doing it anyway kind of game, you know? It, it looks a bit like the board game Settlers, and uh, you can buy tiles for one ether. <laughs> That's pretty expensive. Uh, you can buy tiles, you can build stuff on them. I'm not sure if you'd seen that, but there's like a rocket launch pad here, or the 76ers logo there, you defended against Vikings who were trying to destroy your tiles. So there was the first kind of baby steps into the, into the realm of NFT gaming. And I, I thought that's, that was kind of cool, Ethereum. Now, let's fast forward to the present. I mean, Ina, she, she outlined it well already. Now, Ethereum is home to the most important collections that we see today. The CryptoPunks, the Bored Apes, the World of Women, uh, the Mutant Apes. And uh, everything went through the roof. The interest skyrocketed. Partially, you, you coined it well, probably spearheaded by the interest of many pop culture celebrities. And I, and I actually did a little quiz for you. Uh, all, these, all these NFTs are owned by famous people. Who, who have you know? And, and I picked it by resemblance to the actual celebrities. So they all kind of look alike. So who do you think owns this one? Raise your hands, please. There's no, there's no test afterwards. See it? Take your chance now. Any wild guess? Sorry? It's not Paris Hilton, but very close. It's Heidi Klum. OK, who's this one? This one's pretty famous. Eminem, right. Who's this one? It's not Katy Perry, but she's, she's blonde. So the, the celebrity's blonde. Yeah? No, Reese Witherspoon. And the last one, the, there the difference is quite big. <laughs> Very good one, is Neymar. Okay, so but, you know, I, I think you kind of get the idea. These are super famous, uh, everyone knows it. You know, these are stupid pictures, but um, kind of, we know what we're talking about. They're super expensive. And um, here's, here's, a bit of, here's a bit of money history about CryptoPunks. So, I plotted, you know, you see, I did some Excel. Uh, 
I plotted the, the monthly average sales price of CryptoPunks between June 17 and uh, August 2020. Almost nothing happened. It was like they were minted and they were hovering between $50 and maybe $400 a month for three years. There was three years of your and my chance to buy this and get rich. But then suddenly in August 2020, it went from, let's say, $400 to $1,400. And if I had been in the position to, you know, experience this hike, owning a CryptoPunk, I've been like, wow, I can buy a new bicycle or what if I, if I sell it. <laughs> But then came, then came the boom years, the gold rush era, October 2020. You know, this is, this is the price. You, you can barely see it on the Y scale because the Y scale ends at 600,000 US dollars now. And then it's increased. You, so you own a CryptoPunk, $1,600 here. One year later, it's on average 500,000 US dollars. I mean, I've, I don't know. I, I've not seen that before personally. And this has been the boom years. Uh, uh, soon after came a bust. But I think this is part of the reason why we're all sitting here, because we've witnessed this crazy ride. Um, but CryptoPunks, mutant names, they're, they're not the only ones that are out there. Um, this, this is the MFR collection. Uh, and I want to um, visualize some pattern. You know, uh, All the famous collections, what they have in common is usually they're algorithmically created with some parameters that are always changed. You know, For example, there's the parameter headdress. Some have those flight helmets, some have a bandana, some have a beanie, whatever, or um, headphones, different colors, so smoking, not smoking, eyes, you know. They are algorithmically changed. Then you have a collection of, I don't know, 10,000 NFTs and they're sold. Okay, this is a pattern that we see recurring. One thing that I want to dig into is where, where does it come from? Who of you knows this meme? Are you kidding? Are you winning, son? This is one of my favorite memes, and uh, I just want to show that Internet culture is deeply ingrained in the NFT culture. And I think we need to know that in order, if we, if we want to take baby steps towards understanding this whole phenomenon. So uh, Sartoshi, the creator of the MF collection, admitted, you know, I'm a big fan of this meme. I kind of, it, it feels like this is me, you know? So I wanted to make a collection around this thing. And you know, this feeling is also, I think, part of why people want to buy that. You know, Eminem wanted to, wanted to buy the ape that has this, this cap that he's usually wearing. And maybe other, Steph Curry also um, has similar intentions. You know, you, you, you get to what I'm, what I'm saying. Um, another internet culture uh, thing is gaming. I, I, I talked about uh, Ethereum. Um, it's not surprising that many of the um, constructs that spearheaded NFTs are games. You have crypto kitties, you raise a kitty, you, you breed them, you tailor make them, you sell them, you know. Um, this, is, this is what the internet uh, and, and people on the internet do. You have XC Infinity, where you battle with your pets, like these strange crossovers between Pokemon, Digimon, and uh, hamsters. And uh, so uh, games really uh, help getting, getting everything going. And then needless to say, I mean, um, I'm, a, I'm a business economics scholars, uh, scholar. We are very interested in the platforms that are out there. Platforms really acted as a catalyst to making this whole country, culture going because Huge motivation, probably, we get to that, uh, of having and owning uh, NFTs is you can make money with them. For that, you need platforms. Super Rare, OpenSea, Rarible, those are platforms where demand uh, meets supply and creators uh, meet buyers. So they've been instrumental. But talking about platforms, there was this really, um, for me, it was kind of a paradigm shift in the NFT, uh, in the NFT era when the NBA decided to launch its platform, NBA Top Shots. I'm, I'm sure many of you know it. But why has it been a paradigm shift for me? Because formerly, NFTs have existed on the internet. It were, they were difficult to touch. You know, There was nothing physical that I could experience about NFTs. But NBA, they launched um, NFT moments, so NBA moments, but there was, uh, that you can collect and trade and whatever. And there were physical things in the world uh, that were kind of counterparts or equivalents, which is NBA cards. In the US, it's, it's a huge thing. Um, you buy them, you collect them, your, your grandparent has done so, your, your dad or your mom have, uh, have done so, uh, you, you keep on doing it. And um, suddenly there was, this, there was this digital NFT counterpart. And uh, we thought, okay, now there's this bridge between the NFT and the physical world. Let's see if they're kind of interacted. And what we did is, so 
sorry, this is a shameless plug of our own research. Uh, what we did is we, we looked at what the launch of NFT did to the eBay prices of basketball cards compared to a control group of baseball cards. And we found that once this NFT platform was launched, the prices uh, of, uh, of, the base, of the basketball cards took a deep dive. Because probably there was really a change in people's collection habits. Many of them went away from buying these cards and went towards buying those. Um, if you're interested in it, I can share that paper with you. But we were really thinking, okay, this is the first time where we're seeing a material and economic relationship between the digital NFT and the physical collectibles world. Um, businesses soon after stepped in to for further like solidifying this physical digital bridge. For example, um, Tiffany came in <laughs> offering these pendants to, to CryptoPunk owners. They actually, they, they, they made these pendants of gold and diamonds and they went to CryptoPunk owners saying, hey, you know, I made this art. I can make this pendant for you. You have the exclusive right buying this thing. Imagine, you have something digital and somebody offers you to spend a lot of money for something else. But it actually, like all of the CryptoPunk owners that were offered one, actually bought it. Uh, yeah, probably you know it, Nike, with the Artifact Collabo, um, they launched the Crypto Kicks. It's, it's just some sneaker that you can own online. You cannot wear it. Maybe your Fortnite character can wear it. Maybe you can wear it on the metaverse, but that's really for the future, you know? Right now, you don't have any, any real utility of it. Or the Dolce Gabbana glass suit. It's incredibly expensive. You cannot wear it. The impossible tiara. It was, it was really a work of art designing it. It's not just, you know, copy pasting some weird picture of a tiara. There's work behind it. It's expensive, but you, right now, there's, there's no model that you can really gain wearing utility out of that. Uh, just a glimpse of uh, what, what businesses are, or what physical businesses are really gaining out of NFTs right now. Uh, the biggest player right now is Nike. They, made, uh, they make roughly 185 million uh, already with NFTs. There's Dolce Gabbana, Tiffany, Gucci, and Adidas. And um, so they're advancing their business towards NFTs. But there are also businesses that change because NFTs are there in the sense that they're trying to shield themselves from NFT competition. I told you, uh, people stop buying ba uh, basketball cards, the prices uh, uh, go down. Uh, and eBay knows that. And part of eBay's business is this trading card business, super important for them. And eBay knows its weaknesses compared to NFTs. eBay, you know, when I'm selling you my, uh, my Michael Jordan card and you paid $10,000 for that, you're not sure if I ship it, you're not sure if the quality is right. So there's this trust problem, you know? Uh, but, then, but for NFTs, it's not there. Because for NFTs, it's, I post an NFT, you make an offer, I accept, boom, it's switched, uh, I, get, I get your other, you get my NFT, everything's solved. Uh, eBay knows this flaw, so they installed the eBay vault, where it's just basically a vault where the trading cards lie, and when I sell my card to you, you send me the money, and then they tr just tr uh, transfer the ownership rights to you. But the card stays in the vault unless you say, hey, ship it to me, please. So they're kind of imitating this NFT business model, and I think that's super fascinating. Um, now, I think a key part that we still need to understand that was also raised earlier is, okay, why are people buying NFTs? And I'm not going to answer that question today, but there are some things that I think are, are apparent here. Do people want to get rich quick? Well, some of them, I think they, they definitely do. If you follow Twitter, <laughs> these accounts, this activity is ridiculous. Uh, do people just want to collect and nerd around? Well, I, I wanted to when I was uh, 14, 15, 16. Um, that's not my binder, though. I wish it was. Um, or people, do people just want to flex? Um, maybe you've heard it, but there was this, uh, this influencer who sold his Lamborghini in order to buy a board ape because uh, he said, okay, uh, board apes are just a bigger flex. Probably, partially, all of this is kind of true in different shades. Um, but... When we think about the future, and this is really pure crystal balling that I'm doing right now, when we think about the future, I think we need to bear in mind sustainable, meaningful business models that can be enhanced with NFTs. For example, tickets. Who of you remembers uh, what uh, his or her first concert was offline? Raise your hand, please. You remember? Okay, I thought everyone raises their hands. <laughs> So I, I, I know what my first concert was, Metallica 2003, uh, St. Anger Tour. The album was bad, but they opened with Metal Militia. 
And I was like, wow, shit. I, I thought they were opening with some, I don't know, new stuff, but they, they, they played Metal Militia, and it was, it was the, one of the best concerts I ever saw. And I wish I had this ticket today so I could put it on my fridge and feel like, hey, yeah, this is nice. But I don't have. If, if they had tickets with NFTs, I could, I don't know, have it in my wallet and look at it and be proud of it. And I, I have real willingness to pay having that ticket. Like, I would pay a few bucks for, like, somehow getting a time machine and getting the ticket back. But I don't. Maybe NFTs could solve it. Music rights. Property rights in music are horrible. Like artists suing each other, you copy me, you copy, I copy you. Uh, some cultures like that, some cultures don't, you know. Why, why, why can we not use NFTs to, you know, put a fingerprint on what we did? Legal documents, legal documents, I'm German, it's horrible. Germany is just a mess concerning legal documents. Can we not have some NFT technology ease this up? I beg you, please do it. Because right now, it's all about expensive monkeys doing a belly dive and uh, everybody giving up. I have not lost the hopes that NFTs can really enhance our lives. And I think these are some ways that they can do that. Um, museums, we're talking about arts. Uh, there's this um, call from German museums. Sorry, it's a bit German biased, um, but those are the web pages that I can read. Uh, <laughs> German museums say, we need an NFT strategy because, I don't know, they don't really know how to use NFTs, how to make money out of them. Let's be honest, otherwise they don't adopt it. And, <laughs> Damien Hirst, uh, this famous uh, British artist said, okay, hold my beer. He, he had his own strategy because what he did is pretty interesting. Um, he created a lot of, like a couple of thousand, I think, physical artworks and put an NFT to each artwork, sold it. He's famous, he could sell out well. So everybody had this NFT and this physical piece. And then after a couple of weeks, okay, now you gotta decide, customers or art lovers, do you keep the physical piece, do you keep the NFT? Many of them, or like the majority of them, kept the NFT. And I think this also brings us a bit closer to, okay, why do people, what do people, what do people like about NFTs? Probably it was like idiosyncratic to the experiment that this guy was doing, but I think it's a very interesting data point to uh, keep in mind uh, going forward. Now, um, whether we like NFTs, whether we don't like NFTs, I think uh, the mentality is really, really, polarized right now. Some people love it, some people hate it. Um, and I think nothing captures this mentality better than the online review distribution of the Seattle NFT Museum right now. Um, because there's so many people giving five stars loving it. There are also like even more people giving one stars hating it. And let me tell you that. I did my PhD dissertation on online reviews. I've seen a lot of online review distributions, but I've never seen, a, uh, seen an online review distribution like that. And with that, I'd say, uh, okay, Thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure presenting for you and uh, keep the questions coming. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, this has been very funny, entertaining. I loved it. And now we're going to welcome our second speaker, which is gonna be Paul Holliday, a teacher at the Tilburg Institute of Law, Technology and Society. So please welcome Paul. All right, so um, thanks for having me. It's awesome actually to see everyone in person, uh, same thing. And um, I'm obviously gonna be talking about this from a legal perspective. And basically I wanted to title my talk today, NFT Mania, Property and Art. Uh, I am gonna be focusing largely in the digital art area in, in order to just provide us with a working example that we can use when we start to look at some of the legal con um, concepts in this regard. But essentially, that's kind of how I want to approach it is from a legal perspective in that regard. And so uh, a little bit of background about myself. I'm South African uh, originally. So I was uh, raised in South Africa, studied there. I actually practiced for seven years as a lawyer in South Africa before I came and studied a uh, law and technology master's at Tilburg University. And um, before that, though, I also actually worked at a startup tech company that was actually working on a blockchain application. Uh, that application was more in the context of uh, financial investments in the green economy and sustainable development. But so that, that was actually what kind of got me interested in this kind of law and technology sphere and what, you know, navigating that area. 
So what I want to do, though, is be a typical lawyer and provide a disclaimer before I go into anything else. <clears throat> and so this is a quote from uh, Kevin Lowe and E. Mix. So basically, they said, many lawyers do not understand the core technical terms in the blockchain narrative and incorrectly assume that they map directly onto similar legal terms. Concurrently, many technologists make false assumptions about how the legal rules work and thus imagine legal systems ripe for disruption. So I'm going to today try to address some of these incorrect assumptions. The disclaimer is essentially that I am a lawyer. I do not claim to be a techie in this regard. Uh, but obviously, because a lot of my research uh, is more in the intellectual property side of things and, and stuff, we obviously do endeavor to understand the technology side as much as possible in order for us to actually try and make sense of this divide between technology and law in that context. So, um, yeah, my research largely deals with, for example, intellectual property, particularly copyright. Uh, currently, I've been working on platform regulation in particular with the Digital Single Market Directive. Um, so just that's a little bit of extra information there. But before we can really talk about NFTs, we actually just have to deal with this idea of smart contracts. And uh, I just want to point out that smart contracts, even though they are named that way, aren't necessarily smart, okay? Uh, you might want to know why. Well, firstly, smart contract is not a term that was given by lawyers. It was a computer scientist that originally coined the term smart contract. And uh, in this, uh, before I get to that, so... In this regard, what happens is that a smart contract, essentially what it deals with, it automates the obligations uh, of a contract, right? But what a contract actually is, at the end of the day, is an agreement between two parties. Now, a lot of computer scientists are like, oh, well, smart contracts, what they do is they essentially make it impossible to breach or break a contract. And what, that's an incorrect assumption, referring to uh, the earlier slide where it doesn't take into account certain contractual principles. For example, in contract law, you have the doctrine of mistake and misrepresentation, which apply depending on which country you live in. But what these doctrines essentially look at doing is they recognize that because a contract is essentially an agreement between two parties, there's a meeting of the minds. That's the phrase that people like to use in this context. And mistake and misrepresentation essentially acknowledge that sometimes one of those parties isn't clear about what they're actually agreeing to, okay? Which means there isn't a meeting of the minds. And so what mistake and misrepresentation do as doctrines is they essentially say, well, because there wasn't a meeting of the minds, we can void the contract because there wasn't an agreement in the first place. The problem with smart contracts is that, especially also on a blockchain, it's very difficult to go, try and work backwards in that regard, because once it's verified on the blockchain, that's essentially it. The only other way to deal with that is through a fork, which is, is also very problematic in that regard. So just wanting to point out that when we talk about smart contracts, please don't think that they are necessarily these intelligent things. They actually do not necessarily represent the legal context very well and they do not map nicely into the legal context that we're going to be talking about. So many of you probably know about this example. So Beeple, or the artist uh, Mike Winkleman, and uh, he sold the NFT for this artwork over here, uh, which was called uh, Every Day is the First 5,000 Days for $69 million. Okay, I'm going to kind of use this as uh, a focal point or an example to talk about some of the con concepts that we're going to be uh, looking at. Um, and the first thing I want to deal with in this regard is these are some of the claimed advantages of NFTs. So, okay, NFTs allow artists to engage directly with their audience by presenting digital or physical pieces of art, eliminate, eliminating the need for agents. Okay, so that was one of the things that Beeple himself actually said as well. Uh, that he could engage with his audience in that regard. Uh, the other one, for example, NFTs present an alternative. So artists can mint an NFT for a piece of work and set their own prices on easy-to-use online NFT marketplaces. There's actually another one which I didn't include in this slide, and that's basically that one of the claims that NFTs um, supposedly accomplish is they create scarcity in the digital world uh, because of, uh, we're going to deal with hashing a bit later, but 
the point there being you take a digital object which otherwise wouldn't have scarcity in and of itself and through minting of an NFT you create scarcity. So the idea behind that is that I have now this slide clicker in my hand because it's a physical object. I'm the only one who can be holding it at any given time. So that means it's rivalrous, okay? You cannot be in possession of it when I'm in possession of it. And as a result of being rivalrous, we almost see what well, that adds value to it. Because, you know, if you want this clicker, you either have to come and take it from me or you get what I'm trying to say in that regard. Whereas in the digital world, with the ease of copying and stuff like that, we would need to try to create that rivalry. And one of the claims of NFTs is that it does this, okay? So <clears throat> I need to talk about the central role of hashing because obviously NFTs operate in a blockchain and the blockchain being a decentralized ledger in that regard. And hashing essentially entails the use of an algorithm to take data of an arbitrary size and produce a deterministic fixed length output known as a hash. Okay. Why this is important. So essentially, you can almost view it as a, a digital finger, fingerprint for uh, a more simplistic way of looking at it. Why, why would this be important? Well, archivists use this a lot in order to verify data, guys. It's, it's a way of seeing whether something has been tampered with in a digital sense. And so it becomes actually very important in that regard. And that, that's kind of one of the strong points uh, of blockchain technology in that regard is that um, once something is verified, you can be assure, assured that uh, it is the right thing. Sorry, I've gone. So <clears throat> the point behind hashing is this last point here. An identical file will always produce the same hash. Okay, so we were talking about scarcity earlier. Can anyone see a potential issue with that at all? I'm curious, does, it, does anyone, can anyone see a potential issue with that? Anyone want to has it? Yeah. An identical file will always produce the same hash. Okay, so that's true, but there's another thing that also comes in here. What if I change, say I take a photograph or, or a digital artwork and I change a single pixel on that file. They are visually identical, but it'll create a different hash because the, it's not the same file. And this actually what happens is it opens it up to this theoretical possibility for an artist, and that in this instance, let's call it the dishonorable artist, can essentially sell multiple visually identical NFTs on different uh, blockchains or on, on different... Um, so, so they'll make different NFTs by changing something, and I'll show you how they can change it. So these are ways that you could essentially change an artwork, and it would visually look the same change a single pixel, use a different hashing algorithm because there are more than one out there and they will produce different hash values, resizing the artwork slightly, or using a different hash chain. And basically the hash chain is something, it includes metadata, but if you change the metadata, you get a different hash value at the end of the day. So you could include different information. But essentially the artwork that's meant to be forming the basis for this NFT, visually speaking, is identical and yet you can still create uh, essentially different, different NFTs that are unique in that sense. All right. So that's part of the problem. Now, if artists can do that, it's also true that um, you can mint an NFT for an artwork that you yourself did not create. Okay. Obviously, this is problematic. We talk about it from property law perspective, but even from copyright. Generally, what happens, if I create an artwork, I receive the copyrights in it. Why? Because it's my own, cre my own creation. It's original. I exercised my intellectual mind to create it, and as a result, the copyrights are um, assigned to me as the author of that artwork. But with NFTs and minting, I don't have to have the original to mint an NFT. And obviously this creates huge issues. And this is actually something that happened to an artist called Corbin Rainbolt. He's a digital artist and he tweets a lot about his artworks. 
And what he discovered, actually, through a lot of his fan base, they, they tweeted him and they said, oh, I see that you're selling some of your artwork as NFTs. And he's like, that's not me. The problem with this as well is that currently there's no central authority for you to go to for any grievances that you have in this regard. So there's no recourse. The only thing that he could do was essentially to take all of his artwork down and then re-upload it with a, a digital watermark to prevent it from being stolen. Okay. So I'm going to go into now a bit of a short legal analysis to try and like, okay, how do we analyze NFTs from the perspective of law? And I'm going to use a digital artwork in the example when we talk, when you talk about this. But we can look at it from three perspectives. So the first one being embedded on a medium. Now, your classic example of this would be paint on canvas, okay? Um, for purposes of this example, let's assume that all digital artwork is on a medium. And I say this because sometimes there's this misconception also that digital artwork exists without a medium. But the point here being it has to be stored somewhere, and that somewhere is always going to be physical. Even on the cloud, there's still going to be a server somewhere or whatever that is storing that artwork. Okay? Or often you need some kind of medium to display it. You know, you either need to print it, you either need to show it on a screen somewhere. The point being it, to, to completely separate it from this idea of a medium is probably artificial in that regard. Okay. Then you can look at it from the perspective of copyright. So one of the rights in the copyright bundle is the exclusive right to make copies. Another one is just communicating it to the public. So, you know, making it available to the public and such. And um, normally what happens is the copyright will be held by, say, the author or the creator of the artwork, um, unless it is specifically assigned to someone else. So that is something that, okay, if I create an artwork, in order for you to have any of the copyrights, I would have to assign it for you. And normally that's done through some form of license, a contractual agreement between yourself and myself. And then the last one is as pure information. Okay, another perspective that we can uh, look at digital art. So, an NFT essentially embodies neither the first perspective nor the second. Okay, why? Does anyone want to... Has it a guess there? You see, <clears throat> the problem with NFTs is that we spoke about it being essentially a digital fingerprint when we're looking at hashing, okay? Which means that the artwork itself is often not in the NFT. You basically have the NFT which is representative of the artwork and essentially has a fingerprint to it to verify that it is that artwork, but it's not the artwork itself. Okay, so that's the first one in that, well, it's more abstract in nature then. The second one also was the copyright perspective, right? Okay, so unless the copyright is specifically assigned in the NFT, the person who purchases an NFT wouldn't have any of the copyrights. As we've often discussed in this, okay, artists will often assign copyrights uh, in, to an NFT, but the problem is here is, how much of that? Is it in perpetuity? Would, would someone always have the copyright? So what happens if I buy an NFT, and then what happens to the person buying it after that or further on? We'll get to that in a little bit. So essentially, um, an NFT actually represents the pure information aspect that I mentioned, the perspectives that we were talking about. Because it's not the artwork itself, it's a representation or a fingerprint to the artwork. And you don't actually acquire the copyrights unless um, it's specifically assigned to it. And the problem with pure information is that it's not subject to property law or copyright. Mere ideas are not protected by copyright, only the expression of them. If I have a narrative of a book in my head, I do not have copyright until it's actually written on a piece of paper or typed up on a computer. Okay. So no property rights can exist when it's an abstract idea or pure information. So then the question actually comes in, so what does the purchaser of an NFT actually acquire from a legal perspective? What do you guys think? I mean, based on what I've just kind of told you, I'm curious to know what, 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 
What do you think the purchase of an NFT acquires? Yeah. Okay, very good. So essentially, a right of display. Yeah. yeah. Um, and even that is essentially a little bit vague. You know, it's not particularly clear. Yeah. Of what, though? You see, remember, the NFT itself doesn't contain the artwork. So, and I'm just talking about the NFT. Not the artwork it's linked to, but I'm just talking about the NFT. Yes, true, to that specific uh, artwork or that digital copy of that artwork, okay? But, and it is unique to that, but it's not the artwork itself, though. This is, here in, this is where, the, where the issue lies, actually, essentially. This is why it gets highlighted in this example, okay? So it looks more like some form of vague license to display uh, or exhibit, but even that is often limited, particularly in copyright. What kind of copyrights do the authors or the artists actually want to give? Often it's not, it's limited. Sometimes it's, you're not allowed to publicly display the work. It's more just a private display in your own home that you're limited to. Because why the artist just doesn't necessarily want, envision or want you to be able to display the artwork wherever you want in the public, and that's part of the copyright right communication or uh, making available to the public. Okay, so this is what, so we talked about this now, so license to display. And herein lies another problem from a legal perspective, okay? If it is a license to display, remember what I said earlier about contract law. Now, contract law also has another principle or doctrine called privity of contract, meaning that a contract only binds the parties to that specific agreement, okay? If, if I entered into a sale agreement with any of you to say, buy this clicker, so I paid you money and I bought this slide clicker from you. And I, what, if I had paid that money and then you hadn't given me the clicker, it would be absurd for me to go to someone else and demand the clicker from them. Why? Because they weren't party to the agreement. Obviously, that's absurd. But then the question comes in is that, well, if... All you are actually acquiring is a license to display. And what is a license? A license is a contract. It is an agreement between people. What happens to subsequent purchases of an NFT if all you have is a license? And technically, that license is only binding on the original people that were party to the agreement. That then becomes the question, because not many artists want to grant copyrights in perpetuity, going for the rest of time, so to speak. And also there are rules around copyright in the sense that they are limited in time. They do not necessarily last forever. They enter into the public realm eventually. So in that sense, then an NFT also starts to lose value even if you have been given the copyrights in that regard, because eventually those copyrights won't be valid anymore. So it's a very interesting one in that sense because the question then comes in again, what do you actually acquire? And if it is this vague license, it still ends up from a legal perspective being problematic when one tries to consider, well, subsequent purchases. What, what, what do they actually get? Do they get the same copyright? And even then, that's going to be limited in time. So anyway, that's where I wanted to actually end today, just because I wanted to highlight some of the legal issues that come in with regards to NFTs. I am not for one moment saying that NFTs are bad or anything like that. They have a use, clearly. We've seen that in the way that artists are able to use them uh, in, in the context. Beeple, for example, he had a great um, online following, and as a result of that, he was able to leverage that following to get basically sell an NFT for $69 million. Fantastic to him. Well done. But I do want to point out some of the legal issues with regards to NFTs, because a lot of people just think NFTs, oh, wow, they're so valuable. I'm going, but it's still problematic to view an NFT as property in the traditional legal sense. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So what I gathered is you get bragging rights, and that's it. Uh, I would invite both of you to uh, uh, answer some questions from the audience. We have some time. So if you want to pick their brains, now would be the best time to do it. Yeah? Uh, 
Okay, uh, we can start with you. Thanks. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Emil. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I was particularly interested by your mention of IP law. Um, so for a project, I'm generating new crypto punks. So I'm taking the original 10,000 punks, feeding them into um, an implementation of some generative algorithms. The output, if I choose to mint them, do I own them? Do the people that wrote the algorithm own them? Or is this some inherent property of those that made the original crypto so punks? It's a, very, it's a very good question. And I'm going to use the example of Beeple in, in the context of here. So when he minted the first, the every day's first 5,000 days as, as an NFT, okay, he obviously used a smart contract, which also points out to one of the issues of calling a smart contract smart because he then assigned himself as the owner or the author, okay? Why it's not a smart contract is because in contract law, you can't contract with yourself. And if he was the only party to the contract, then it's not a contract at all. But essentially, particularly in, in artworks, you can assign yourself as the author or the owner when you first mint it, if that makes sense. So from a property law perspective, you could assign yourself as the owner. Whether law would necessarily recognize ownership in the traditional sense, that's a different question. <laughs> But it doesn't stop you from assigning yourself as, as owner in that regard. Can I follow up on the question? Yeah. But uh, can, the, can, our, can the crypto fund owners not uh, file a DMA takedown request? What is a DMA? Digital Market Act takedown. So, you know, you, you sell my song that I wrote, then uh, uh, the, the, the original song owner says, hey, please, please take that down. For example, that happens on Twitch, you know? When people uh, play music on Twitch, where people that, where, where they have to pay royalties for, Twitch takes that down using this act. I mean, can that not be applied? To I use the I use the example of a uh, Rain Cor 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 and he yeah I was wondering yeah. Had, so basically how he what he did was he contacted the platforms where the NFTs were being sold and they did take them down. But the problem was that some of the artworks had already been sold, yeah. even they though done. they weren't his. And here I'd like to introduce kind of the. Um, twist of it because I'm not copying original artwork. I'm gener generating new one, new ones with similar features. And is that still subject to a DMA? I think that you want to stay away from that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It really, it re copyright really comes down to how similar, because and that that's always going to be then actually a factual thing that ends up being decided by a court. And that's why courts always say we deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. And the classic answer from a legal perspective is always, it depends. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> this might seem stupid, but like, uh, how are the NFTs actually purchased? Like, are they uh, bought with dollars or with Ethereum? I think it depends. Um, it depends, okay. So, for example, on NBA Top Shots, you can buy NFTs, and it's purely with dollars, so it's super easy. So it had mass adoption very quickly. But um, most NFTs, um, you have to buy with cryptocurrency, so you have, to, you have to get a wallet, then you need to go to a cryptocurrency broker, get cryptocurrency on your wallet, and then you transfer. Okay, so, like, um, is there like an intrinsic value uh, of the NFT related to a currency in the real world, or there isn't? Like, how do we calculate the value of an NFT? <laughs> <laughs> That's a $100 million question. Uh, we don't know. So, it's, so I think a big part to it is um, social buzz, like how many people are actually interested, because in economics we usually say, you know, a thing is worth as much as people are willing to pay for it. Sounds like, you know, sounds like the cat is biting itself in the tail, but it's really what it is. If um, all of my one million Twitter followers want to buy it and they're, and they're scarce, uh, price is going to go up. And of course, they're also like a storage of cryptocurrency. So there's this interaction, you know, cryptocurrencies go up and go down. If I have an NFT that's valued in cryptocurrency, you know, I have this thing, and then the cryptocurrency goes up. I earn money through that, if that answers your question. And yeah, there's also a follow-up there. Um, I heard you uh, uh, summed up some uh, advantages of uh, um, NFTs, but uh, I didn't hear uh, 
uh, new te technology can be quite disruptive. Do you see, one of you, uh, some disadvantages of NFTs? So from the, from the legal side, um, one of the assumptions is often that NFTs will be, and that the legal aspects are ripe for disruption. That's one of the assumptions that often get made. Uh, the problem, like I said, though, is that um, it's actually very difficult or it doesn't map very well from just the technology side into the legal side, okay? Um, that also doesn't mean that the legal side necessarily has to be disrupted um, in that regard. Obviously, law tends to lag behind the development of technology, as we all know that. Um, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that principles in law that have stood for so long, and the reason that they've stood and haven't been changed is because they're wise, the way they're applied in terms of how they're applicable, doesn't mean we kind of th throw the bot out with the bot, you know, or the, you know, that whole concept. So we still look at it from that perspective, and I think the danger here is with the NFT mania side is getting so hyped up and, su and such that you don't actually take account of, well, would it be beneficial to actually disrupt the legal system in this regard? Uh, we actually need to take a moment and take, take stock and actually gauge whether or not we want to develop the law in this area. Um, because in particular, it would have huge issues, particularly around property law, which have been established for ages. And so in order to disrupt that area, we need to be really convinced before we essentially go that route, if that makes sense. Yes. There's a question behind you. Hi. Um, I was wondering for you, do you think due to the popularity that they're going to change some laws in certain countries? Um, <laughs> interesting question. I mean, do I actually think they're popular? Yes, currently. Do I think they will be? Uh, I, I, I'm not... I'm not actually so sure in that regard. I mean, we've already seen a huge decrease in the prices of NFTs already. So there was an initial hype the same way there was an initial hype around cryptocurrencies in general. Um, so at this stage, no, I don't think so. Um, do I think that NFTs have promising applications for artists? Yes, but they're not infallible is what I would also say there, yeah. All right, and yeah. if I can ask one more question, uh, can we read your research somewhere? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Maybe. Um, I can tell you the name and you yeah. can uh, Google it or I can just send it to you. I don't know. Yeah, that's... Uh, it, it's yeah, public, yeah. so yeah. All right. But I wanted to... There, there have been law changes. For, for, for example, there's uh, things called initial coin offerings. So you give out a coin to fund your business, uh, for example, your, your NFT project. Yeah. Uh, and there have been countries who said, we don't want that. Uh, and there are countries who say, hey, we all do that. So kind of like Singapore is really big on that. And I think so there have been, you know, some, some things in that direction. It's interesting, though, because is that a law change or is it basically them yeah. saying, no, we're not actually going to allow this to happen, you know, because in a way it's kind of maybe even more just clarifying a legal standpoint of going, guys, our laws don't apply to crypto and therefore we're actually going to stamp it there. Yeah. So I would even argue, is that an actual change? Not so sure. <laughs> I'm going to have to stop us there. Uh, I'm glad you have a lot of questions, but we're going to ration them. So now let's take a 10 minute break and be back here at 50. Well, let's continue. Sorry to break your conversations, but we're continuing on. Um, I'm going to start with a fun fact that each day there are about 3,200 NFTs sold, which means during our little 10 minute break, about 20 were sold. Who bought them and what were they? How, they look, how did they look like? Well, there are a lot of projects varying in popularity, important to different groups of people, but some of them are more valuable than others. I want to ask you to do a little quiz with me, and we're going to do it by raising your hands. Oh, wait, sorry. Again, I'm going to have to close your eyes for a second while I do this. Ooh, no. Okay, great, great. You didn't see anything. Nothing happened. You are still not seeing anything. Uh, yeah, this is important that you don't see it because I don't want to give too many things away. Okay, great. Okay, so 
I'm giving you three NFTs and I want you to guess which one had the highest latest selling price. So the last price they were sold on. Think about it good and hard, make up your mind. And I'm gonna point to each one and you tell me with a show of hands, which one thinks the most expensive one was the first one. How many of you think the first one was the most expensive one? Okay. The second one was the most expensive one. Okay. And the third one. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Interesting opinions. I was, uh, some of you thought I was going to trick you with putting up a goblin. That was the point of their collection to uh, point out the absurdity of what people will buy. But to me, it's even more absurd that these are the real prices of them. So the right one is the most uh, expensive. And the left one is actually a piece of a collection that uh, a part of another piece of that collection is in the Moko Museum in Amsterdam, if you ever go uh, check it out. Uh, for me, it's personally the prettiest one, but yes, it's the least expensive one. So it's all in the eye of the beholder. And it makes you think what art is. Is it the visuals? Is it the senses? Is it the concept? the transfer of a, of a concept, or is it the absurdity that people will buy a goblin for 40,000 euros? Let's see, let's talk about NFT cultures with our next speaker, uh, which is Inte Lorich. I hope I'm doing that right. She is a PhD student of socio-technological socio socio imaginaries in blockchain culture at Utrecht University, and she's going to talk about NFT cultures that will shape the cultures of our tomorrow. Okay. Ooh. I keep giving away. I keep giving away. I'm sorry. working. I just have to untangle <laughs> a little bit before I can start. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, so yeah, my, um, my PhD on blockchain imaginaries, uh, social technical is also, <laughs> you can forget about that word uh, if it's too difficult. Uh, but uh, it's, it's kind of situated in media studies and cultural analysis. So, um, yeah, I'm yet again a kind of different uh, angle on NFTs. And when I get asked to say something about NFTs, often the question is, are they good for artists? Are they going to change the art world? And um, sorry, a bit more space. One second. Um, and uh, so are they good for artists? Uh, and my point um, often is that even though clearly, I mean, we all know the story about people, some people are making a lot of uh, uh, money or just a nice amount of money, also possible, right? Um, but uh, there are many other people uh, involved in NFT culture, cultures, um, beside artists and they all kind of pull at the technology uh, and uh, yeah this phenomenon in different ways they have different um, um, things that they want to do with it um, and um, so yeah this is kind of uh, what I want to do here is really kind of show those different some of those different cultures I think there could be uh, even more um, and kind of yeah situate how they relate also to uh, the art world. Um, so <laughs> starting with uh, kind of a broad question, um, what are NFTs? Now by now <laughs> we've already heard some interpretations of what they are, um, but I would still kind of like to see what you guys think. So I've written a bunch of options here. So are they a new form of patronage for the art? 
Uh, are they a genre of art? Are they a medium for making art with? And I think this uh, was my question that I wanted to pose to you also. Uh, maybe we have different interpretations of what a medium is. Um, is it a proof of ownership? Are they investment objects? Or are they uh, a new data stream in the digital economy? Um, does anyone have a preference for an, what, what would you say if this was an exam question? All of the above. All of the above? <laughs> does anyone have a different, op uh, different idea? Is there one that's maybe not the case? Did you? Number three? All right, okay. Um, I have one that I have most problem with, um, but uh, let's go through them. Um, so NFTs as a new patronage uh, system. So patronage system is to be a patron of the art, right? It's to support uh, an artist or a, a kind of uh, scene uh, uh, by uh, buying their work or other, other kind of ways of, um, of supporting their kind of continuing career. Um, and an example of kind of uh, an NFT, uh, like a, or a blockchain based um, form of patronage is uh, this pleaser DAO. And DAOs are uh, decentralized autonomous uh, organizations. I won't go into the technical <laughs> detail there, but uh, they're basically a way for people to kind of pool uh, their resources and make collective decisions about um, where they want to invest and in this case which artists they want to support um, with their kind of uh, pooled money. Um, so that would be, that's the idea in the, in the culture at least as um, of, a, of a patronage uh, system for the arts. Um, but, uh, and this, this kind of holds also with the idea of blockchain the way it came up was always uh, kind of trying to root around uh, kind of authorities that were there uh, before. Um, if you're talking about cryptocurrencies, um, with them you don't need banks anymore, for example. Uh, and the idea here is that you also don't need, um, for example, galleries uh, anymore. Um, but at the same time, we have uh, the British Museum and many other museums. Um, that are selling NFTs as well. Um, so they are kind of, they are the, the traditional middlemen that are also using uh, NFTs as a form of patronage uh, for the museum, let's say, maybe not directly for artists, but for the art world uh, in general. Um, so it's a way, you know, that you can kind of uh, donate uh, or yeah, support uh, a museum. Um, so I would be curious how you think about this as well. Um, but there's at least people thinking that it is uh, a patronage system. Um, NFTs as a genre. This is the one I have most problems with. Um, because, well, uh, I took a screenshot of OpenSea, which is one of those uh, platforms where you can um, find NFTs. Uh, and just under their art section, this is the first three that show up. This is completely random, right? Or I don't know <laughs> what their uh, algorithm is that shows uh, the first three. Um, uh, I would have a hard time defining a unifying kind of aesthetic uh, among these three. Um, and this is also something that uh, Domenico Quaranta, who writes a lot about uh, NFTs, uh, he said that uh, there is nothing that identifies and unifies all works of art, uh, all works collected under the definition of crypto art, uh, other than the fact that they are tokenized on the blockchain or that they have been created by a self-styled crypto artist. Um, and what he also has an issue with is these terms, crypto art, uh, NFT art, blockchain art, um, they're all kind of used interchangeably, but we, and we, we don't really know what we're referring to. Um, often, I do think like kind of in common uh, like speech, they are used as genres, but I don't know, that's, I would say they're not. 
a genre. Um, but yeah, there's it, there's this sense I think in uh, in how people uh, think about NFTs to see them as a new genre of art, which I think is debatable. Uh, then as a medium, uh, so uh, this I guess is where legal terms and um, yeah my common person <laughs> uh, language um, differs maybe a bit uh, because I'm thinking about um, uh, yeah what is the medium of an NFT uh, in the sense of is it uh, a painting is it uh, photography uh, and stuff like that which I guess has something to do with where it's stored as well so this NFT um, if I would have to de de uh, describe the medium of this NFT, Melting David by Trippy Michelangelo, um, uh, I would say that if I took a like, kind of broad definition of the whole kind of history of this thing coming into being, it's a sculpture, it's a picture of a sculpture, and it's then also uh, a um, digital graphic uh, on top of that. Um, but it's not an, the NFT is not part of the medium here. Uh, because if this, um, if I only took that, if I only look at that image, it doesn't change whether or not it was sold as an NFT, or uh, yeah, if there was an, uh, if it was minted as an NFT, um, the image, the artwork stays the same. So in this case, I would say the NFT is not uh, the medium. But and this is where I had a question. Um, there's also work that kind of pulls the NFT, the, the, the hash of the NFT, into uh, the artwork. Uh, and generally that is uh, generative art or generated art. Um, stuff that keeps generating is um, generative art, but this I think is more generated. Uh, at, the, uh, at the moment of minting um, this particular NFT, it looks at the hash uh, that is created and pulls that into and feeds that into the algorithm to kind of, um, uh, yeah. Um, uh, so wait, maybe I should start from the, <laughs> the other side. Jan Robert Leegte, uh, he is the artist of this uh, work and he made basically rules for a whole series of artworks uh, to exist. This is number 249. And it's all about the square should look um, they should have these uh, shades of gray, um, they should be uh, centered in the middle, uh, but the, the hash of the NFT actually determines how many uh, squares there are, how close together they are, those kind of things. So th if you see the series, there's also all sorts of different kind of compositions. Um, so here I would say um, the NFT is actually playing a part in the medium. So. <laughs> I hope we can discuss later also, like, would this change the legal, uh, legal status? Um, and I think this is also something that kind of pulls at a history or, or refers to a history in the art, uh, art world. Um, for example, Solovit, uh, who made this wall drawing number uh, 95 in 1971, uh, which was not the wall drawing itself, but was instructions for a museum to make uh, the wall drawings, uh, so you can see like it has to be, have so many lines on the walls and they have to be drawn in this way. Um, so just like the, the, the algorithm in this case, there the instructions allowed for the art to kind of come to life, I guess. Um, and then proof of ownership. Um, this is something that already uh, came up, of course, that um, the NFT is not the artwork. The NFT is the thing that points at it. Uh, and the proof of um, ownership, uh, of authenticity, uh, sometimes I, I leave those <laughs> like very precise terms to the lawyers, but um, the, in, in a sense, the NFT kind of points to the not artness of the NFT, right? It, it is, in a, this is what Ryder Rips kind of played with, the nothingness of, 
the, the not artness uh, of, of an NFT. And so he made a one by one pixel PNG that was transparent, which I put there and I, and I put a frame around so you know where it is. Um, and uh, yeah, the, I find this a very interesting work that kind of critiques and, and, and kind of reveals something about NFTs. Um, and they're, yeah, um, they're kind of the way they, the, yeah, the, what people talk about isn't necessarily an NFT. And Jonas Lund even went uh, kind of more on the, on the contract side of, of the NFT. Um, and he kind of, this is a series of uh, NFTs. This one's called Down to Earther, but it's a whole kind of series of different agreements uh, that people make. Uh, if you buy this NFT, you may not travel by airplane or business for business or pleasure for a year. There's also in perpetuity down there. So that's, I am not sure how this is enforced or checked, um, but he's kind of, you know, making people aware of what actually is an NFT. Uh, and it is really about these uh, agreements, about contracts between people. Uh, and this also is actually nothing so new uh, because Solowit that we saw earlier also um, if, a, if a museum then uh, showed uh, or painted that wall drawing that he instructed, he also gave them a certificate of authenticity. Like this isn't, this isn't just any drawing according to my instructions, this is a certified one. Uh, so this kind of contract art is something that yeah, has existed for uh, several decades already. Um, oh yeah, let's get back one second. Um, because what I, I promised that I was going to talk about more than art and more than art world. Up to now, I've basically talked about the art world. Um, but um, yeah, I think there are already starting. We're already starting to see kind of different ways to, that people engage with uh, this thing called an NFT, even within that um, within that scene. Um, but something that also came up earlier already, um, the virtual world, uh, I think is a good first step outside of the strictly speaking art world. Um, so the central land is, uh, is one of those virtual worlds where, where people kind of, um, yeah, uh, come together online and, and, you know, interact with each other. Um, but as humans, we want to kind of convey our uh, identity, who we are, what we stand for, what we like, we don't like so just like you know clothes in the real world uh, communicate a part of that also in the virtual world you can buy sneakers or band t-shirts or um, any any of those things um, so this is really something that people think um, uh, could be a big kind of use case for nfts um, as, of course as we see kind of the metaverse becoming bigger business so to say with uh, Facebook uh, jumping in uh, last year, um, the yeah the expectation kind of is that this that we I hear sometimes people uh, saying like we're all gonna be in these virtual worlds and that's gonna be the dominant way of interacting. I'm not so sure about that, but I mean for certain people that particularly kind of people that uh, like to game, this is not so not so outrageous. Um, then, as investment objects, and this also already uh, came up, of course, but um, what I think is interesting is, is really the connection between um, selling art as an artist um, on these very fluctuating and very hyped kind of um, yeah, markets. Um, so Beeple already kind of set the stage with the 69 million uh, sale that he did. Um, uh, but art and finance have always been intertwined. Uh, this is, again, it's, it's, it's really nothing new. Um, art has always been a way for people with excess, um, yeah, excess resources to kind of uh, buy something and try to speculate on it, sell it for a higher price. Um, and with NFTs, that is just made easier, I guess. Uh, and uh, why it's so interesting as an investment object is, of course, that these whole kind of um, 
the communities that get created through a lot of marketing and a lot of kind of famous people being involved and a lot of hype um, kind of produce a baseline that is not to be trusted, basically. Uh, you said it also in the, in the Q&A uh, a little bit, like if you, if you sell your artwork for uh, 10 ETH one day, but the price of an ETH, of an ETH rises the next day, then your, your artwork uh, kind of rose in value as well. It has nothing to do with the artwork or you or your career. Um, but it can also, of course, go the other way. Um, and um, this is, to the moon is, is a phrase that people often use uh, to kind of say, well, this, this NFT, this, this blockchain project is going to the moon, this crypto coin, um, it's rising in value, you should buy it now, like get in on it uh, because you're going to get rich. Um, but um, the fact of the matter is also that um, people, like you can make money on, uh, with financial speculation, also betting against uh, something. Uh, so that's, uh, it's all relative, like the moon could also be down uh, for someone. So um, this is just to say um, it is for a sector that is already uh, so precarious, the art world, uh, it is a highly unstable ground to base your income on, on I would say. Um, and then the last one, NFT as a data source, and this is one that I am not really hearing a lot of people talk about, um, but um, I think it might become more of a, of a topic uh, in the years to come. Um, people often say that uh, uh, on, the, on the blockchain you're anonymous, uh, you're not traceable, you can do anonymous uh, transactions. Um, but also stories come out that uh, people that do actual act, like illicit things on the blockchain also uh, the police find them and know how to kind of trace them. So um, that's already kind of debatable whether you're anonymous. Um, but uh, with these profile pictures that, uh, that I showed earlier, the CryptoPunks and those kind of things, uh, especially with the bored apes uh, that people are using as profile pictures, uh, on their Twitter, and Twitter has this new um, verification system that you can you get a check if uh, if that is actually or you it's a hexagon if it is really your NFT. Um, this, of course, makes it much e more easy to uh, see uh, the, the the kind of legal identity or the real name of someone uh, in connection to a wallet address. Uh, so once these things kind of become more um, more yeah, normal, uh, get get kind of normalized in, in culture, um, the, that has major effects also for uh, the anonymity of the crypto world, basically. Um, and I would expect, as economy works, that there would be business models, there would be scamming models, also based on that uh, new possibility. Um, and uh, so that, that's something that, yeah, I, I, that's another kind of, um, yeah, chaotic force, I would say, <laughs> uh, for the art world if you're um, using uh, one of the major uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, so what to think of NFTs? Um, I mean, I would, I would say, uh, the, I mean, like any technology, NFTs are not neutral and they are certainly not innocent. Uh, there is way too much money uh, involved uh, and um, many different people want to um, yeah, kind of use that for the, their own um, profit. Uh, so, yeah, being someone that kind of engages with the art world a lot and, and talk with, like, with artists and that are involved in this, I am anxious for like how that's going to turn out and whether the art world is going to be more precarious because of it. Um, that's, uh, so tread with care would be my, uh, my advice. Oh. Thank you.
so we saw a lot of, uh, I think in this presentation, uh, showed us a lot of prices and I forgot to tell you, I wanted to tell you while I switched the slides. Uh, Madonna's too expensive one was 180 Ethereum and the doodle that is on sale so you can buy it is, uh, uh, well, they're asking for 5,000 Ethereum. So be quick before somebody outbids you. Uh, and now we welcome our uh, final speaker, who uh, was my professor of, of logic, introduction to logic and philosophy, uh, Nathan Wildman. Uh, he also teaches digital aesthetics, and he has a lot of interests of research. Uh, yes, which are in, uh, interactive fiction, metaphysics, philosophy of language, aesthetics, and video games. I wanted to read those because they are so uh, amazing. And I want you all to please welcome Nathan Wildman. Okay, cool. Is that working? Can you all hear me okay? Nice. Uh, give me just one second while I casually try not to break this. I almost did at the last one of these that I was at, so it was very good. We'll just do that. Okay, still working okay? Beautiful. Nice to see everybody. How are you all doing? Well, sort of see. I mostly just see a big white blob. Um, so, to be honest, what I'm going to do is going to cover a lot of the very similar ground as Paul did but in a slightly different way. Oh. Technology, it's wonderful. So what I want to do is talk about ownership and the ontology of art. So ontology here isn't the kind of computer science term where we might think about how to structure things or what sorts to place things in, but it's the old philosophical term. That is, we're literally trying to figure out what the hell something is. So one of the topics we've talked about several times is what an NFT is. And to be really honest, when you're, I'm done, you're not going to be any wiser. Um, but I'm going to hopefully blow some smoke and make you feel like you learned something. That's the trick. So I want to come at questions about NFT ownership and NFT ontology by getting a run up through traditional views in ontology of art. So that, that'll be the first bit, ownership and art ontology. Then we'll talk about, cool, can we, can we transition some of that to the NFT thing? The answer is going to be no. Um, and then in the very end, I want to talk about NFTs and value. So this has come up a couple times already. Um, I think it was in some, some of the questions and certainly in some of the discussion. So I want to say a little bit at the end about what it might be to value NFTs, where that might be coming from, and in particular, different senses of the notion of value that might be in play here. So that's the plan. Let's get started. Um, so here's what I think of as ownership. And this is not really a philosophy of law or a legal approach, but I think this is what ownership is. It's the right to exploit. Right? That is, if you own something, you can exploit it in various different ways. Exactly how you can exploit it depends upon the kind of thing it is and the kind of things you can do. So in the ontology of art debates, in aesthetics, what you tend to have is a contrast between two different, we'll call it, kinds of things. And again, this has already kind of come up. We can come at this really nicely by thinking about traditional literature. This is actually a neat little book. It's, it's an NFT book. So the author has put the book up as an NFT. It's very weird because there's 10 different copies of the book that are all literally the same, except for some metadata, and he sold the 10. Anyway, I actually tried to order a hard copy. It was supposed to come two weeks ago, and for this, never showed up. So appropriate, the NFT guy <laughs> stole my money. Right? <laughs> <laughs> So let's think about the difference between a physical copy of the book, right? One that you might have in your hands if he'd actually mailed it to me, right? You might put it on your coffee table. You might read it. You might burn it, right? You might use it to clean up after the dog, anything. You can exploit the physical concrete object in lots and lots of different ways. And arguably, this is what ownership for that kind of a thing is. It's being able to do that sort of thing. It's having the right to be able to do something like that to it. 
Contrast that with what I've got called an authored work. Now, this is a little bit weird, but we can make sense of it. Imagine that we all had a copy of the book. We all had a physical copy. There's something that each one of those copies would share. Exactly what it is, it's hard to pin down. It's something like, let's call it a structure. It doesn't even necessarily have to be the same sequence of words, because maybe my copy's in Spanish, and your copy's in Dutch, and Paul's copy's in, well, I guess it'd be kind of Dutch, right? Coming in Afrikaans, um, right? But they're all, in some sense, the same book. Right? Can we see the, see the idea there? Right? So what we can think of as the authored work is this sort of abstract object that's instanced in all of the physical copies. Another way to come at the same idea is if you think about traditional Western music. Right? You can have lots and lots and lots of different performances of the very same work. So whatever that notion of work that's lying in the background there, that's what we can think of as the authored work. Now, what is it to own that? Well, it's, again, the right to exploit it. But how do you exploit it? Well, you can't, like, kick it or burn it or use it as a coffee table or something like this. It's not the right kind of object. Instead, what you can do is you can print more copies. Maybe you can implement the same thing in a different media format. Exactly how this goes will depend on various copyright laws and things like this. But it seems very important that we pull the difference between ownership of the physical object versus this authored work apart. So Timothy Boucher owns the authored work. He wrote the book right, that's been multiply instanced. Whereas I technically, I guess, own a copy. Who knows where it is? With me so far? Cool. So this is the kind of thing that comes up in philosophy of art all the time, right? especially at the intersection between philosophy of art and philosophy of law. We might talk about owning paintings. And of course, when we say we own a painting, that's actually slightly ambiguous. It's ambiguous between owning the physical object versus owning something like the image rights. That's rough and ready. Talk to the lawyer to get something slightly nicer there, but you get the idea. Right. So owning a particular painting gives you the right to view it, to display it, maybe to resell it. Right. What it doesn't give you the right to do is make prints of it, put it on t-shirts. Right. Contrast that with owning something like the copyright. This is roughly parallel to owning something like the authored work. Because what can you do then? Cool, you can make prints. You can put it on t-shirts. Maybe you can figure out how to get a seven movie deal out of this. Right. Maybe not this painting, but you see the idea. Right. Here's the really neat thing. Copyright and the physical objects can very clearly come apart. Right. Someone can own a particular painting and not at all own the copyright to it. They don't have the right to reproduce the image. They just have the right to display the particular image they have. OK, cool. So again, traditional views here. We talked about it with literature. We talked about it with painting. How about when we start thinking about digital artworks? Now, here is a, an absolutely beautiful digital artwork made by, if I may say so, one of the best digital artists currently working. <laughs> Um, so this is a piece of glitch art. What I did is I took a picture of my dog, can't quite tell that, right as she was waking up, and then I glitched the hell out of it to produce what is this very cool, I think, image. Now, when it comes to digital works, I think basically the same principles apply. It's messier, but the same stuff still goes. Now, here's one of the reasons why it's messier. Sometimes digital works are understood as services rather than as goods. They're not objects that you own, that you have, but instead they're services that you've paid for. So I don't know, some of you might have been here when we were talking about streaming. This is the thing that's happening a lot with video games. It's ruining a lot of the video game industry. 
you no longer own a game. Instead, you're paying basically for the right to be able to play it on someone else's server. And then they can turn the server off. You didn't lose anything that you bought because you never owned the thing in the first place. But we can set those ones aside. Let's just think about the kinds where they're goods. Right? Well, it still seems like if you own a token, an instance of the work, a copy, right, that allows for access, use of the associated digital assets, the code. You can display it. You can glitch it if you want and maybe try and make a new work. Possibly interesting questions there about generative artworks. But of course, that's still not the same as owning the authored work. Go ahead if you want. Take a, take a picture of this with your phones, right? But I am going to charge you for it. <laughs> and then owning the authored work, again, is going to allow for re-implementation, for reconfiguration, maybe reinstancing in other media forms, things like this. Again, I hope we can kind of see how this is just synthesizing a bunch of the stuff that we've been told before. One thing I want to mention here is a very fun, very weird legal case. So this is something I've written a little bit about. And it was a case of theft. And what was stolen was an enchanted amulet and magic mask. Don't laugh. That's what was taken. So what really happened is that we had, I think he was about 14 at the time, a 14-year-old Dutch boy was effectively mugged by two 16-year-olds. They held him at knife point, and they made him log on to RuneScape and give one of them the magic amulet and enchanted mask. Now, it was ruled theft. In fact, it was technically ruled robbery, assault, plus theft. Right? But here's something weird. What was stolen? There are no such things as magic masks and enchanted amulets. Sorry, don't want to ruin people's dreams. So what was actually taken? Well, it looks like it was something like access to the relevant digital objects. So we're already starting to get a grip on maybe how we could understand ownership of these digital things. It's maybe just even accessing them. If they're not necessarily always on our hard drives because, you know, high-powered magnets. We'll come back to the RuneScape case in a bit when we talk about value. OK, so again, the traditional views we can kind of make sense of. There's this distinction between tokens and the authored works. We can push it and make it work a little bit when we start thinking about digital artworks. Some things get a little bit weird. What exactly the work is is hard to make sense of. Is it the image? Is it the underlying code structure? What is the thing that you would actually even be credited with creating or inventing? What happens if we have generative art programs? Who owns those? There's a really interesting case that happened in Australia last year right, where uh, the Australian court decided that the AI could be credited as the patent inventor, but the owner was the person who ran the program. Interesting ways to type how to push this back into the ontology of art. But OK, so cool. Ownership, it's the right to exploitation. And it gives you different kind of rights, or maybe better, it gives you different kinds of abilities depending on the sort of thing that we're talking about that's owned. Applied to concrete objects, applied to abstract objects. And it's a little bit fuzzy with the digital stuff, but we can make it work. Cool. NFTs, fuck all that up. Right. NFTs do not fit into this traditional story, at least as far as I can see. And here's the reason why. It's because of what they actually are. So again, this has come up a bunch, so I'm just going to say the same thing that's come up before. Right. What is the NFT? Well, I'm going to put this in terms of a generic. That is, it will allow for some exceptions. But NFTs aren't images. And NFTs aren't the copyrights to images. Probably the best way to think about them is something like an access route to an image. It's a tag. It's a pointer. 
It's a very particular pointer. It's a very specific. We can isolate it, reproduce it. It's perfect. There's no other way to get to that pointer other than through this very specific blockchain. But that's what the NFT is. It's not the thing that you get to through it. Again, most of the time, there are exceptions. So what does that mean? Well, here's one thing. It means that if you own the NFT, most of the time, you don't own no image. If the person who owns the hosting site that your pointer points to decides to take the image down, cool, goodbye picture, and you have no legal recourse to take it back because all you own is the pointer, my dude. Right? Same thing too. Most of the time, you do not own the right to reproduce that image, to use it in other places. Maybe you own the right to display it. Right? But even then, that's not always the case. Remember some of the cases Paul was talking about where we have artists whose work was effectively taken and turned into NFTs. This is basically taking someone's painting and displaying it in your house. <laughs> or maybe better, is building up a very elaborate mirror system so you can always see the art they've got hanging in their house. <laughs> so what is an NFT? I think it's basically just a pointer. Again, there are exceptions. Do people know whose NFT this is, since we're playing that kind of game? So, this is Seth, Green, Seth Green's uh, Bored Ape. So he started an NFT show, originally put on YouTube, then he isolated it down. Uh, here was a problem. A scammer stole it from him, <laughs> and he couldn't make new episodes until he bought it back. <laughs> now, here's the reason why that was possible. Because remember, I said most of the time when you own the NFT, you don't own the image rights and things like this. Bored Ape is an exception. Board Ape says, oh, hey, no, if you own it, then you have unlimited worldwide license to use, copy, display the purchased art for purpose of creating derivative works. Cool, so that means if you own a Board Ape NFT, you can put them on t-shirts and things like this. But this is very much the exception rather than the rule. And here's the other really interesting thing. Note that this is basically just for commercial use. Nothing prevents anything about personal use. And Lord help you to figure out what counts as personal use for digital files. I just happen to have them sitting on my FTP server. I can't control who accesses it. So one of the things I wanted to, to, to kind of raise here is, again, I think this shows that old or traditional approach to art ontology doesn't quite map. It's not quite mapping up. But that could just be because, to go back, frankly, the thing we're talking about here really isn't something like an artwork. But maybe that's unfair. The other thing I want to mention is I think thinking about NFTs this way shows why there's a problem on both sides, effectively, with the kind of right-click, save-as debate. People relatively familiar with this, this was the way to troll people on Twitch, or on Twitter, rather. If they have an NFT, right, you right-click, you save it, you re-upload it as a reply to them on, on Twitter, and then it's like, dude, you stole my ape. It's like, no, dude, I did not steal your ape. I copied the image for personal use. <laughs> right? Because what would it be to actually steal the ape? <sighs> I don't even know. I mean, it's something like stealing the, the certificate that says, this is my pointer to get you to the image. That's not something I can right click save as, at least most of the time. Again, there are exceptions, strictly speaking with the apes, there's issues about having the image rights, but you can see how this goes more generally. So here's the best analogy I can come up with. I don't really like it, but it's the best one I can come up with. I think owning an NFT is very similar to something like owning the wall that the Mona Lisa hangs on. In that what you're kind of owning is a display space. 
the pointer, right? It gets you to the image. Of course, the image could be moved by the person who actually owns it or has the copyright over it. And importantly, owning the display space does not necessarily get you the right to exploit the image or to exploit the authored work that's behind it. Again, not a perfect analogy, but it was the best I could come up with. I've been pretty sick, so. Okay. So NFTs, eh, there's a lot of FUD if you haven't picked it up from me. I assume everyone knows what I mean with FUD, right? Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. But okay, I'm not sure about the ontology stuff. I think it's, it's difficult. I'm really unclear exactly how to map it anything better than something like a pointer. I, to maybe come back actually to, to, to something that was just in the previous talk, with regards to thinking of, I made some notes, with regards to thinking of NFTs as something like genre or medium, I'm very much in agreement. I don't see how you can actually think of them as these. I think if anything, they might be ways that genres are typically packaged or ways that you occasionally get to medium. I think the interesting ones are the kind of generative artworks. But even then, I suspect it's probably just generative artwork that's doing the heavy lifting here rather than the NFT part. Still. So let's set the ontology and ownership questions and just think about value. Is this NFT valuable? Well, that's a bad question. And that's a bad question because it's so open-ended. It doesn't make sense to just ask if it's valuable because things can be valuable for lots of reasons. Man earlier talked about wanting to have the ticket from his first concert. I still have my baseball glove from when I played Little League years and years ago. I imagine that's not valuable to any of you. It's just a worn out piece of leather but it has nostalgic value to me. But that's not the kind of thing we're after when we think, are these things valuable? I think we're thinking of value in two specific ways. We're thinking of either monetary value or what we might call aesthetic value. Monetary value, I think, is straightforward. Is it worth a bunch? And that's beyond my pay grade to settle. Basically, all you gotta do is convince enough people to buy it and then it will be monetarily valuable. A very familiar thing that comes up in this space. Everyone knows about tulip mania. Everyone familiar with this? In 1634, the Dutch go crazy for tulips. And they drive up this huge bubble. By 37, the whole thing's crashed. Everyone's lost a ton of money. All just because people basically invested it with monetary value. There's an interesting question here about whether currency is just something that we're kind of making up as we go along, but we can talk about that later. Let's think about aesthetic value. Is there something aesthetically valuable about NFTs? And I think, to be honest, a lot of times the answer is going to be no. In fact, even earlier, I forget who it was, someone wrote down talking about the art's often bad. Part of the reason the art's often bad is because it is just algorithmically generated. Little tiny variations, a lot of it already starts off kind of eh, and the algorithm isn't really trained to produce something that's beautiful. That's not what we care about. But still, I think there might be other ways for it to be aesthetically valuable. So one way we might come at it is to ask, is this art? And I think there's a difficulty here. And this is a long, fun, horrible debate about what it is to be a work of art. And I'm going to pitch you two stories. One of them is a kind of formalism. So formalism, eh, not really doing so well anymore, is a kind of view that people like. But the idea was that art are artifacts, or artworks are artifacts with certain formal properties. So it will have certain maybe color distributions or dynamicity or something like this purely formal, just purely baked into the work. The problem with this account is if NFTs are just pointers, I do not see how they can have any of these aesthetic properties. So the answer then would be no. Here's the other one, and this is the interesting one for where we're at. 
is there's an institutional theory of art. And the institutional theory basically says, hey, art is what the art world says is art. And exactly who counts as the art world is a bit hard to figure out, but you might think of people who manage galleries, people who buy and sell artworks, etc. Here's the really cool thing, and I think this was just touched on a second ago. That directly, I think, links it back up to the monetary value. There'll be incentives to make it art and make it aesthetically valuable if it's worth a bunch of money. This isn't to say I think this is bad, but again, remember, what is it we'd actually be aesthetically valuing? It ain't this picture. It's the tag. It's the pointer that got us to the picture. It's the hash. So again, as for financial value, yeah, lots of people think it's got financial value. Here's a crypto punk, right? Sold for 2.3, or two, Jesus, 23.7 million dollars in February of this year. Um, and actually to go back, I think it was this one. I think this one was sold for 25 million in March. So a lot of money in these pointers, um, which is nice. The last thing I want to say is there's not really a problem if we think that the pointers are aesthetically or monetarily valuable. Because put really bluntly, things don't even have to exist to have monetary value. Just think about the RuneScape case. What was stolen? Magic Amulet and Enchanted Mask. There ain't none of those. So the fact that maybe to think that NFTs have monetary and aesthetic value means some weird stuff has that, that's okay. We already buy that anyway. So that's basically me done. I hope that was interesting. And I hope you kind of come away with some thoughts about the ontology of NFTs, about how there are some issues with understanding exactly what they are, and still maybe, even if we grant that, how they could still be valuable. Thank you very much. You can leave your uh, mic on. We have the Q&A uh, thing now. I uh, welcome Inte back. Thank you for the presentation. And now we can uh, focus on your questions for, yeah, for uh, the, our two remaining speakers. Um, yeah, do we have any questions? Okay, I will start here again and then go. Sure. Uh, well, I had a question on, on valuation. Um, so in traditional finance, if you buy a stock, that is a right to a share, it's a share of a company, gives you the right to a share of the company's profits. And it seems to me that uh, the um, valuation, like this sets a, a ceiling, right, for like what is a minimum or a maximum value of a stock based on like a reasonable multiple. Uh, it seems to me that it's the same thing when valuing NFTs. Like if you base it only on the aesthetic value, mm -hmm. it's very hard to set a maximum or minimum ceiling. But if you base it on the rights that is connected to it, like you mentioned with the board apes, um, it's a lot easier to find an actual value. Does this mean that we're moving towards kind of that space where um, you'll get like a Starbucks NFT that is like gives you the right to a cup of coffee sort of thing. I mean, I'm frankly really doubtful about that. So one reason is actually think about the, the kind of board ape case that you were talking about. I would think that one of the reasons why there'd be some kind of value in having the image rights for it is because of something like broadly aesthetic value, right? Or let's call it maybe broadly social value. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I think that can then maybe be re-understood. So it's kind of bootstrapping itself up. Because of that, I don't think there's going to be a floor. And I don't really think there is, there's a ceiling either. You just get enough hype and people will buy into it. Or if the hype goes away, it ain't worth nothing. Yeah, I would say it's, it's really a lot of marketing and a lot of kind of making people believe it is valuable 
so that it becomes valuable, yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, for Nathan, do you think then maybe talking about this institutional theory that you uh, mentioned with, um, it makes me think like art is, yeah, art is what the art world wants to see as art and you see it a lot with like, yeah, people like Picasso or whatever, like all these famous paintings, it used to be like, okay, so you can buy this painting and this is, for the elite, it's very special, it's worth a lot, but who made, like some people have like modern art and it's just three stripes on a, on a painting and that's like worth millions. So do you think this is not the case like with this uh, board Ape, for example, and CryptoPunk, that it will be like the new elitist like art, but then in a different way in the virtual world? Like the, that has that future as art has it, basically. Yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the things. Actually, I suspect you've got lots more interesting <laughs> things to say here. But my my suspicion is that this is the, uh, one of the things that, and this is this is kind of crystal balling here as well. Um, that what might happen is the kind of thing that tends to happen with outsider art. So it starts off with a particular kind of aesthetic, and maybe some social drive to it, and people pick up on it and then it becomes commercialized, and then it becomes big money, but a lot of the force behind it gets drained away. Um, and then it just becomes nothing but ways to change a bunch of money around. Um, but that's, again, that's the FUD talking. That's the fear, uncertainty, and, and uh, yeah. This but, you know, maybe I would add to that also, if you talk about Picasso, it was also, you know, why we remember him is also because he, was so innovative in you know um, the aesthetics that he that he used, of course. Um, and if I translate that to um, uh, to NFTs, uh, then what I find interesting often is the work works of art that are kind of um, reflecting on the technology while they're um, also using it uh, to uh, to be sold, for example. But like this kind of technology art that, you know, I think the the gen, the, the young Robert Leegte uh, work is kind of uh, an example of that. That shows you a little bit what's happening behind the scene. It kind of pulls attention to the to the hash. But there's also work that, um, yeah, has some kind of rules about uh, how uh, owners have to engage with each other or what you can do with it. Like kind of using the contract as the artwork, basically. Um, and that is something, if, if we, um, then it doesn't even necessarily matter anymore if it's sold as an NFT, but that is uh, kind of something that I would see that, that could start to become recognized as, a, as an important kind of aesthetic uh, or a, something that kind of looks like a genre, uh, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I entirely agree. But again, I think I think the thing that's really cool there is the is the kind of generative process. The fact that it's an NFT is yeah, no, irrelevant, yeah. right? It it could just be that it it feeds its own algorithm back in and runs through. That's the cool thing there, yeah. rather than that it's using a hashtag or something like this, or not a hashtag, but a hashtag. Yeah. Uh, we have more questions, and then uh, we can. <clears throat> like, my question was about the fact, like, are there any statesmen, statements or, like, um, some people, like, s properly explaining why they bought an NFT, an NFT? Because, like, I think that there are, like, we kind of have traced two paths, and one is the NFT, and the other one is the uh, digital art that... It's, it's pointing to basically, so like I think that that ca the second kind of business could be growing a lot. We have art generated by uh, AI. We have art generated by uh, algorithms. Uh, we have uh, digital arts, and um, for the same purpose, it's just maybe it's that second kind of thing of digital object that is shown in a museum of. Uh, yeah, digital art, I wouldn't really know how to call it differently. But the NFT is something very different. So why would a person buy an NFT but for hype and uh, this? I, I, well, yeah, I was going to point to that. One of you had a Twitter. Um, um, 
the flex. Yeah, the flex. And I think more, like even more, is also to belong to a certain community. Like board apes, if you buy a board ape, you get to be in uh, the club, you know. And there's this Discord that you're uh, part of. And lots of NFTs have that kind of uh, structure. Suddenly you're in a dis Discord where Snoop Dogg also is, you know. <laughs> that's, um, that's cool. Um, so th I think it's a lot about community as well. I absolutely agree with that. And, and I think if, if one of the things to kind of take away is that we can pull apart this talk of digital art and making a market out of the digital art and things like this and distributing them from the, the NFT stuff, then cool. I think that's a nice result to my mind. Uh, speaking from the view of earning money from NFTs or investing, uh, isn't it worth to create them more than rather than buy them and sell them later? Who makes them? <laughs> Can you explain a bit more what you mean? I mean, who makes the NFTs and who uploads them? Isn't it worth more uh, to like create them yourself instead of buying some and selling them la later for a higher price? Uh, well. I don't know if you have a good... I was going to say, this might be a good question for the economist. <laughs> the cultural studies of the philosopher. Yeah. But I mean, uh, yeah. So one thing is, is thinking about an issue with generating the images. So one way a lot of these images are generated is, again, just running some kind of algorithm to produce them. But that's not really generating the NFTs. The NFTs are the specific kinds of things on a chain. They're these hashes. They're pointers, et cetera. What's the value there? Well, you kind of got to get people to buy in. So if you just make a ton, you're sitting on something that's not really going to be useful. I, I forget. Oh, God. So, yeah. yeah, go ahead, go ahead. The, I mean, one point with that also is that uh, there's a lot of talk of like NFTs kind of democratizing the art world. Like anyone can, you know, make an NFT um, uh, and, and sell it. You don't need any, you know, gallery or representation anymore. Uh, but you know this, uh, you know that that if you just make an NFT, you know there's so many, no one's gonna notice one extra NFT that someone made. You know, so you really need to. There's a lot of marketing to it. There's a lot of knowing the right people. Um, yeah, so that, that there's um, there's still a lot of hierarchy, I would say, in that space. Another, another kind of parallel case, actually, I think that was mentioned earlier, was kind of initial coin offering or something like this, an ICO. And those only really work if you get people to buy into your coin. If it, if it, if it was just valuable to purely mint them, that's all people would be doing, is just pumping them out. Right? But the problem is, to, to make them doesn't mean anything if nobody else gets on the train. That's the trick. Right, right thank you. Um, I'm going to have to stop you with the questions, but we will get back to them. Uh, we're going to invite the other two speakers uh, for the panel discussion now. Uh, we have some questions that we uh, were burning to ask, so we will start the discussion with those. Uh, and after that, uh, we can uh, fill it in with uh, every, everywhere where our discussion goes. Um, okay, let's discuss. I have a question for all of you. Sh okay, I think Nathan already <laughs> put oh, <sorry>. his <laughs> mind <laughs> that NFTs shouldn't be seen as real pieces of art. But if art is evolving and revolutionizing in a way we cannot yet comprehend, can, is there a possibility where you can see it as a future art? If art, uh, uh, traditional art was seen as a medium where you could create something, but where a medium here becomes maybe the bragging rights, maybe the sole flex of it, maybe the, the things that you can use change not to be anymore a canvas, but a different thing. Can you see it going into a, the tradition, uh, ever be seen as real pieces of art? 
Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I would point to the generative work again, but maybe you have uh, something. I wanted to say this beyond my competency. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's, that's right, really where I, if the work that uses a bit of the actual data of the NFT in the creation of the artwork, that's to me what gets closest to the question. Um, and th there is work that does that. So um, you could say of particular NFTs that they are art, um, but that is a very, very, very small minority. Okay. Maybe one, one possible comparison class is if we think about conceptual art or something like this. Um, uh, so Untitled Ross in LA, I think is a great example of this where the work is just a pile of candy, a 175-pound pile of candy, and view, uh, gallery viewers are, are encouraged to like eat the candy. And when you own, or when a gallery owns the work, what they actually own is something very similar to like the, the instructions to build it, or a little certificate saying that this pile of candy isn't just a pile of candy, it is this artwork. And that's not too far off from something like an NFT. So if more and more conceptual art gets developed, I think there might be a kind of uptake on particularly the NFT as the thing of the art, rather than just the kind of generative products or the things they're pointing you to. Um, yeah. Um, no, never mind. Yeah. Um, it was interesting, because I actually had some friends who were uh, um, uh, fi studying fine art, and uh, it's interesting we use the the word pieces of art here, because also in a way I actually find that problematic. And I'm answering this funny enough as a lawyer, but more talking about, I don't know, I feel like the nature of art actually is to essentially push the boundaries of what one considers art. So in that context, very much exactly what you're saying about NFTs, if you tie it in, gener in a generative sense, uh, then it becomes the artwork. But also that from a legal perspective, just to point out that that's also problematic because the more something is generated by an algorithm, it means that you don't have the copyright because you didn't actually exercise, it's not, your, it's not yours as an original. You didn't create it, an algorithm did. The code for the algorithm would be subject to copyright, but the product of the algorithm wouldn't be. But can I, can I ask, so who did, who did the Mona Lisa, the brush or the artist? <laughs> Good point, but okay, if I, um, for example, using the algorithm there, just to, just to use an example, uh, often when you have that kind of art, it uses data, input, um, in order to generate an, an I, artwork at the end of the day. Yeah, but the parameters for the data have been, I, I, I would say very rarely would an NFT, um, like collective, use some data that belongs to somebody else or that, I don't know, it's just sand at the sea to yeah. generate the collection. Yeah, I'm more just talking about the, the data that's input. So who do you identify as the author in a copyright sense? Is it the person who selects the data and inputs it into the algorithm that then generates the artwork? Or is it the, the, right, the person who wrote the algorithm, the person who wrote the code? See, this is just a debate that comes up in the legal sense, not being able to identify, well, who's actually the true author of the end product at the end. But why is, because well, that's actually the question you were asking, like, why is an algorithm different than a brush? Um, like, it is, the, the, the artist is using that thing to make an artwork. Why is it legally different? Because not, it's not always the artist that makes use of an algorithm, for example, to generate something. So that, that, that's the person, they create an algorithm particularly in order to create the art. Um, and, and we're now talking about it more in a general sense and probably getting sidetracked. <laughs> but, no, but it's, sorry. If yeah. I, so in, in uh, information systems, computer science, economics, people say, you know, it's a system. It's made by man. If, the, if your program doesn't run, it's not the program's fault. It's your fault, the programmers. The problem is always in front of the screen. It's never behind the screen. So... It, it's in a way techno deterministic. You can tell it what to do. I mean, you can insert some random element, sure. Like you, you made a good example with, you know, with the hashing that determines what it looks like, but still, it's deterministic. So maybe just to kind of chip in, because this is something I've been thinking about a lot recently. Uh, stable diffusion stuff, people have probably seen these recently. 
again, generative kind of programs for art where, you, in, this, in this case, the, the real fun one is uh, you put in text and then it spits out a picture. Here's something people have been getting mad about, is other digital artists copying their inputs. So they're, they're basically saying, hey, I, my, my artwork was finding out the right kind of way to push the algorithm to do something. If we kind of buy that, then I think it is just a brush. <laughs> but I'm not really sure that that's a super good argument. <laughs> but I'm, I just want to flag it up. Because I think that's an, it's an interesting kind of parallel there with, within the people who are already on the side of like, this is generating new works, and the person who's running the algorithm is genuinely producing something. There's a kind of weird tension even internally there, I think. Uh, Can we get the audience in? Yeah. There was a question there. No, but like, I was just going to make a point that, like, uh, if uh, me and uh, Leonardo da Vinci have <laughs> the very same brush with the same colors and stuff, Good for you. the results <laughs> will be very different. But if I have the same data in the same algorithm and we put inside the same data, me and uh, Mark Zuckerberg or whoever, uh, NFT artist, will produce the very same image. So, like, it's, it's kind of different in that way, I, I think. That, like, it's the way you, you use that brush, um, if you use it in a very specific way, it, it's easier to get to the same result. Like, whether for a physical art form is almost impossible. Right, so, so it should be attributed to you and not to like the tool, right? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, but that, but it, yeah. that speaking for the brush made art piece, not for the algorithm. Go well, the same, same goes there, right? I mean, Mark Zuckerberg has Python, I have Python. <laughs> he can do much more, much cooler things than I can do with that. Yeah, but like I was, I was um, imagining a situation in which uh, two two people have the same data and they they input the same data in the same algorithm, and then the output would be the same. But it, it's sorry, it's really not about inputting data. It's about creating code that does something with I don't know pixels. It's not like I, I put in Excel because like let's say data in the simplest form is in Excel. It's a spreadsheet. It's not like getting it from somewhere, putting it in, making something. It's really the, what the human has created in the code, what, what determines. The interesting there, thing there is you are placing the artist as the person who's created the code. And yeah. that's actually not part of the argument now, because what we're talking about is examples of how a lay person can use the same algorithm and produce the same output with essentially not having any role to play in the creation of the algorithm to begin with. And the algorithm, the writer of the algorithm. Oh, sorry. The writer of the algorithm, so the person who creates the algorithm, they have copyright in respect of the algorithm, the code. They do get that already. The question is, should they get more rights in the product that's created as well? And that's, that's, uh, that's up for debate, essentially. That's what I'm talking about. Because essentially, I, can s I have the uh, exploitation rights in respect of that algorithm. I can market it and give it to other people and then they can essentially create art using my algorithm. The question is, should those people hold copyright in the products <laughs> even though they had nothing to do with the, the creation of the algorithm itself? So anyway, I just wanted to clarify that point. I'm sorry, I have to stop you there just <laughs> a little bit. We don't have, uh, I feel like we're going in a, in a different, uh, in a loop now of, yeah, but, yeah, but. <laughs> um, I want to ask you, you uh, told us about uh, you being in a Discord with Snoop Dogg if you own board Apes Yacht Club. You also get uh, some other rights, such as art to, uh, uh, rights to property in the metaverse or to buy things in the metaverse. If we shift our world to metaverse, at least, in a, in a fun way, in a not so far future, interactive or even living in a virtual space could become the norm for many. What role will NFTs play in such a metaverse? And can you right click save in the metaverse? I, um, I don't think it would ever become the norm. We are always, you know, all, also, I would say, first physical beings, right? Um, so, I'm having questions about like how 
um, how widespread that would become. I think it would be more like subcultures. Um, but um, yeah, that's my uh, idea. And, and, but I do think that NFTs basically make it possible for something like the vet, uh, metaverse um, to, be, to grow. Uh, because through NFTs, you can um, kind of, you know, identify yourself and become uh, an individual there. Um, so maybe in NFTs, there's a um, sort of like you had your cards and you had your letter glove. There's a, a collector's kind of way, like a gotta catch them all Pokemon kind of way. I, I, I guess so, kind of. Um, because... Um, if, if you imagine that something is really scarce, so there's only, I don't know, um, 1,000 of these boots that you can wear in the metaverse, it creates a community among these people. Imagine the festivals, like the music festivals in the Netherlands, Belgium, whatever. You get these laces around your arm, right? You recognize people on campus who have that. You know, you start chatting with them, you feel connected to them, kind of, you know, you made the same experience. If you meet somebody in the virtual space who has a, a thing that's, that's scarce and that uh, she has and you have, I mean, it, it creates something, right? Um, and is, isn't that too dissimilar from what we see in the offline world? I mean, like, for example, when I play Warcraft online, I have this tag in my name. And, and I see other people have the same tag in their names. So I was like, hey, this must be a cool guy, cool girl. <laughs> I agree with all of that. I guess I just don't see why it has to be NFTs. Because, I mean, um, is, I mean <laughs> is it... Is it I mean, I can do the same festival lace. I can, I can literally weave it myself. But there is something, I'm sure, that you can use to identify whether it's genuine or fake. You can you look in the metadata and see, is it minted by Yuga Labs or not? And that, that is for everybody visible. And if it's not by Yuga Labs, well, then I don't like it. I would think also more in terms of like the economy involved in creating such a space. So because NFTs exist, there is an economy around it, and these things get made. Uh, so that's what I mean, you know, NFTs make it possible for something like virtual worlds to, be to become bigger. Uh, because otherwise, I would think, who is going to, uh, you know, invest in it uh, to make it real? Something that I also just wanted maybe to add, and it links to the scarcity argument. Sometimes that is one of the reasons why we find something valuable. Um, and going back to, you know, you use Warcraft as an example, but I don't know if, um, you know, Nathan, I don't know if you've also heard of how um, the problem is the adoption. Yeah. So I don't know if you guys know, but there were some um, people who play Minecraft and build there, and they actually tried to sell the map seed for um, their Minecraft map, which has all their builds on it, as NFTs. And basically, Moyang essentially put a stop to that. They said, sorry, this is not something we're actually going to allow. So then it becomes a situation of adoption. And so what role can NFTs play? Well, if people don't adopt it or allow it in certain circumstances, it won't be able to play a role. Okay. Uh, now you can ask some of the questions as well. Uh, if you, uh, yeah, I saw some of the hands, so I want to take advantage of that. Um, no, I just wanted to maybe add, like, in my opinion, I think the role the NFTs will have is that you can really prove the the ownership of something, right? So without NFTs, you can have Nike shoes in the metaverse, for example, but with NFTs, you can actually prove that they're given from Nike or that they're made from them. And w I think without it, there isn't really, maybe there are, but I doubt there's an another way to really do that in the way that NFTs can do it. I mean, as a cheap example, uh, God, what's the online, the most recent Diablo game? It's something like Diablo Immortal. There's a huge problem with fake orbs, right? And this isn't, there's no NFTs involved in this. Orbs are some kind of thing you use. It's a, it's a free to play game, right? A um, bunch of people bought them on the cheap from certain institutions that basically farm them all the time. Blizzard's cracking down on it massively. And they don't have to use NFTs to tell which ones are good or bad. They can just look in the program for the game. The same kind of thing generally with the metaverse. If we actually mean the metaverse, like the one that Meta is making, they'll be able to see. <laughs> we don't need NFTs then. But if it's a decentralized metaverse, then 
Correct. Everybody sees, no, not only Blizzard. Exactly, because if it's Blizzard by themselves, then they can check what they make. Good. But NFT doesn't make a standard that then everyone can, it's a way for everyone to do it. But then why think there's going to be anything like us to be able to slip between one platform and another and maintain stuff? This is the trick, I take it. What do you mean by that? As in, right, so I've got some goods that I can use in World of Warcraft. I can't use them in Diablo Online. I've got some stuff in RuneScape. I can't use them in World of Warcraft. Right, but if Blizzard decides to take down Diablo, if, they, if, if Wizard of the Coast decides to take down Magic the Gathering Online, your cards are gone, your items are gone. But if NBA Top Shots decides to take down NBA Top Shots, it's still on your wallet, even if it's just a pointer. Even if it's just a pointer, and that pointer still has a, has a, has a history. If, if, if that pointer has been owned by Michael Jordan, even if this artwork is gone, this is going to be 100,000 in 10 years. Like, ob ob obviously, I'm exaggerating, but there's a difference. But note, then, it's not the thing it's pointing to. Again, if the, if the thought was it's something about the good that it's getting us to, then we're not really concerned with the good we're getting us to anymore. Does that make yeah, sense? No. Do you see the... So that was, that was why I was kind of worried. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, uh, one of the questions we had. I, it was recent, we, you said that it's very dynamic and it changes. It can go, it can be a hype, it cannot be a hype. It can go to the moon and back and the other way around. Recently, NFT prices have dropped dramatically by 92 since the beginning of May. What does this say about the NFT market? Does it show that NFTs really are overhyped or just that there are fluctuations in everything? I mean, well, do you want to say? I don't know. So the, a very short answer from finance would be the efficient market hypothesis. It, uh, all the information are priced into a good. For example, if I know NVIDIA is bringing out a good chip then the uh, stock is going to rise because the information that it's going to be a good product is in the price of the stock. And a simple explanation would be not all the information about the NFTs are priced in because we would not be standing here if we had all the information about NFTs. People thought this is going to be this is awesome, this is going through the roof, but the truth is far from that. So, uh, and as soon as that became clear, boom, everything crashed down. Uh, of course, there are other pieces. Wallets got hacked some scams, distrust in the system. It's really multifaceted, but I think it's a big part is information, what people believe, what it turns out to be, something like that. I mean, I, also, I, I would say that the market crashing, okay, that's one thing, but it's stabilizing in a, in a more kind of <laughs> uh, humane level that is not these insane prices, uh, uh, you know, an NFT market that is kind of just, kind of, you know, uh, has a has a horizontal line rather than this kind of line. Uh, that would be good for the arts because um, then you can build uh, a career on it. If you know that this is uh, you know something that's in ten years you 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 can trust that it's that it still has value and it hasn't crashed. So I think more detrimental to the arts world is the hype rather than the 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 kind of settling of the of the space uh, you maybe uh, i saw i always see hands and then i don't see at the moment where i want to engage do you want to ask something about this particular topic yeah no you don't have to <laughs> anything you okay i'm just curious about your opinions on the museums and nfts because for museum, the first of all, they have the physical one, then they have the digitized version, and then they sold out this kind of service. So should we value them equally? Or should we attach more value to the physical one or the digital one, or uh, the service, uh, yeah, as, as we know as the NFTs? And also, the, some museum also sold out those uh, NFT of the work, uh, including something that's already in the public domain. So that would also raise legal issues. So I want to know your opinions. I mean, I, I would be very hesitant to answer that should with any firm commitment there. 
um, in part because I, I think that's very much up to how we want to understand the relevant notion of value. Um, if we mean aesthetically, cool. Maybe there's different things to be said here. When we're thinking about the physical work, there'll be certain properties we want to pay attention to. The brushwork, how it's maintained, how it's lasted. When we're thinking about the digital one, we might be very interested in, say, how it works on particular systems or how it was actually encoded. So we might actually think there about the, the underlying digital object and how it captures the image perfectly, the, the physical one perfectly. So again, different features would be different, kind of important for the valuation there. As for the service, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, but I think there would be things that we might be interested in there too. Which one is the most valuable? I don't know. That's beyond my pay grade to say. But I, I, I think that's sort of how I would come at that. OK, if there aren't any questions, I'm going to thank our speakers for today. I'm going to thank each and every one of you for adding a new perspective to this topic and for guiding us through the whole experience of what an NFT is. I uh, hope we'll be lucky in our ventures with the uh, digital art or not art. <laughs> and uh, yes, I ask you all for a big applause for our speakers. Yeah, that uh, I uh, I'm just going to ask you at the end to oh now I'm still in the stage <laughs> to uh, fill out a one minute survey of how it was, and I want to leave you with the final words of thank you for listening. I hope uh, you have a good luck with art. If you're wondering what it is, if it's a visual, if it's a sense, if it's a story, if it's a concept, maybe it's just them selling you something, even if it is air or a picture of air. That's it. Thank you.